Um, I'm very honored and delighted to be here and so pleased to see so many of my mentors um, and role models here, uh, including Julie, because I worked very closely with Julie and John, of course, when I was doing my PhD research. Um, Susan was on my committee. Kathy and, and Mary and Joy from Man Library are here. I mean, there's so many people here who, who I've worked with and who've had a big influence in, in the work I do now and, and what I've become. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here and see all of you all. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've been asked to talk a little bit about CGIR and what, what CGIR does. Um, and particularly, I think, from, from a gender perspective, what we're doing in terms of gender. Um, and because that's not my primary project, I have a few slides from, from uh, the people who are working on it. And then I'll switch over to talking about the big data platform, which is the stuff that I know and, and has brought together all the different strands of my, my PhD, my postdoc, and the work I did at MAN. So it's really um, wonderful to be here. It's kind of like making a full circle. Um, so that's great. So I wanted to just quickly run over what CGI is. Um, most of you perhaps already know this, but just quickly, 15 nonprofit centers. Uh, we are based in over 70 countries. Primarily, our headquarters are in, in uh, developing countries, with the exception of two, probably. One, one is IFPRI, with whom I'm currently affiliated, uh, in Washington, DC. Um, and the other is Biodiversity in Rome. The others are pretty much all over uh, the developing world, as you can see from that little map there. Uh, we work with many partners. This is not stuff, our research for uh, uh, agricultural development is not work that we do on our own. We work with partners, uh, including academia, including very much Cornell. There are many projects we have with Cornell, um, with, with uh, natural, national and regional research institutes, uh, with civil society organizations or NGOs, um, development organizations, of course, other international organizations, um, and the private sector primarily, because anything that we want, any technology that we want to bring up to scale um, requires that we work very closely with the private sector. So that's, that's a very critical piece of what we try to do. And of course, the work that we do um, ranges all the way from, from the discovery, germplasm development type uh, aspect, all the way through to, to product development and, and sort of dissemination. Um, so it involves a, a, a large gamut of partners, a, a, a fairly big sort of value chain, if you will, there. Um, the other thing is that we, we are very much uh, working across three strategic goals primarily. Reducing poverty is the first one, um, improving food security and, and nutrition, um, and then doing the work that we do in the con context of um, uh, improving or sustaining natural resources and ecosystem services. So those are the three focus areas of our new strategic, uh, our, our CGR strategy, which is now about a year old or a year and a half old. I mean, this isn't anything new, but it's just been, been solidified um, much more to, to articulate that more clearly. Um, and, and all of these, these three fo focus areas, you can't see that very clearly, I'm afraid, but, but they map pretty well um, to many of the um, uh, uh, sustainable development goals of the UN. So, so that's a critical piece of what we're trying to do. In terms of the kinds of technologies, just to give you a flavor of, of what sorts of things um, we, we tend to do. Um, you, you see, I'm not going to go over these in great detail, but, but uh, submergent tolerant rice, scuba rice, uh, which can survive underwater for two weeks, up to two weeks, uh, biofortified crops, uh, aflatoxin um, uh, resistant uh, uh, technologies, um, uh, resistant varieties, particularly there's, a, there's, there's been a, a long standing project at Cornell, um, the, the Borlaug rust tolerant, what's it called, BGRI. Borlaug Initiative uh, to, to develop rust tolerant, uh, stem rust tolerant wheat, uh, which, is, which has made a, a big difference in, in halting the spread of, of um, wheat rust, which is very lethal. There's new, newer work on uh, to address maize lethal necrosis. Um, there's work in the agroforestry area, um, and then both, both to, to um, to leverage nitrogen fixation and also to the, the, the last bit here with the brachiaria forages is inhibiting um, biological nitrification to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it spans, as you can see, the, the work that we do spans all the way, as I said, from product, uh, um, you know, from, from germplasm development when you're developing resistant varieties all the way through to um, product development and, and dissemination. 
And how do we do this? We primarily operate now through the CGI research programs, or CRPs. And we're in the second round of the CRP portfolio. The portfolio itself um, is around close to $1 billion, all of it. So um, this newest cycle is, is a six-year cycle, starting January 2017. Um, and it consists of sort of three broad categories of, of programs. Uh, the first is the agri-food systems programs, and they are more commodity focused primarily. So you see the fish, maize, rice, wheat, et cetera, roots, tubers, bananas, um, very much more commodity focus. Uh, you have the cross-cutting global integration, in integrating programs, um, and those are the, uh, programs like CCAFs. You might know it as CCAFs, uh, the Climate Change Agricultural and Food Security Program. And these are all led by different centers. So within the cross-cutting global integrating programs are the Agriculture uh, for Nutrition and Health, A4NH, uh, PIM, or Policies, Institutions, and Markets, um, the Water, Land, and Ecosystems, or WLE. So these are cross-cutting programs that span sort of ecosystems more than being focused on, on germplasm de development, commodity uh, development. And the ones that I'm most familiar with um, are what we call the cross-cutting platforms. And that's a very new piece of the portfolio, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of the Gene Banks platform, which used to be considered a CRP, or a CGR research program. It's now being considered a platform. Uh, but the two new ones there are Excellence in Breeding, um, and Kelly Robbins is here, who is very involved uh, from Cornell in, in the Excel Excellence in Breeding platform. Um, and the Big Data and Agriculture platform, of which I'm, a, 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 I'm leading one of the three modules, one of the key modules of that platform. And I'll talk much more about that as I go along. Um, so that's sort of the, the mechanism um, of, of operation for CGIR currently. There's also the, the bilateral projects, so that there are you know, donors who come to a particular center and who want to fund a particular project in a particular region. Uh, those are sort of sitting outside the, the CRP portfolio at large, but in general, those bilateral projects also map to our uh, larger CRPs. So there's, there's a very, we're trying to work in a very harmonized manner across all of these different uh, activities. Um, some of the key focus areas, I've, I've mentioned some of this before, but uh, building and maintaining global uh, store of, of, of seeds, that's a very critical piece, and, and some call it the sort of the jewel in the CGR crown, the gene banks. Um, and there, the, there, that's a picture of the Svalbard uh, vault, which is where all of the, 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 the seed collections, there's a, basically a duplicate copy of seed collections sitting there. So if there's a, an, an immense global catastrophe, you can, or, or not, even regional, you can go back and, and, and retrieve some of the seed. Um, creating new improved plant varieties, germplasm development. Uh, new tools and approaches for farming systems. Now, this could be something like conservation agriculture, which is something that I've worked with fairly closely when I was at CIMIT. Uh, so developing the technologies and the best management or better improved management uh, practices that would fall under that category. Promoting gender research is a, is a critical piece of what we do, um, and, and I think that's, that's gained interest um, more recently, had, had a big part, big role to play starting uh, with the first round of the CRPs um, and has been carried through with the second round as well. And then turning knowledge into impact, which is where I play a, a, a big role. So my, my focus today for this talk is going to be those two pieces. Um, and I'll start with gender. Um, so gender, uh, this, this is a Genovate, is, is a, a gender for, for innovation, essentially. It's a research project where the, the, that, that has been started pretty recently. Um, the, the team has done, and these, these next few slides are, are from the Genovate team, so I'll, I'll give due credit to them. Um, but, but what they've done is, is uh, done 137 case studies across 26 countries to start with, to try and understand what, what are the, the key uh, themes that, that we should be looking at as we move forward. And some of this may be sort of no-brainers, but, but it needed to be codified, documented, and understood better. So this is kind of a, uh, an interesting slide that I took from their presentation that um, comes out of, most of this work was, was interviews of one sort or another, key informant interviews or group interviews, um, and focus group discussions. So that's what those, those case studies came out of. And this is pretty interesting because it's, it's divided up into, um, this, is, this is perceptions of gender norms um, that affect how women, to what extent women participate, how they participate in, in mace production um, and, and um, 
selling in, in Uganda. And you can see it's divided up into the categories at the top. Uh, tenure, agricultural inputs, uh, labor, uh, and sale, and income and capacities. And, and some of that stuff is, you know, I mean, you could probably predict it, but men don't like their wives attending meetings. This is something I think we've all, any of us who work in developing countries have talked to farmers, we know this, but it's, it's, it's definitely come through. Um, um, men know the traders and the prices, women stay at home, you know, so therefore that's, that's how things should be done. I mean, this definitely accept, uh, you know, affects women's agency to be able to go out and, 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 and make a difference. And yet, most of the farmers we work with are women. So this is, this is very telling um, and, and very critical to address. This study doesn't have all the answers. It's just trying to, to lay the, the, the framework for how we can address these, these issues going forward and how gender make the case for the fact that, that a gendered approach needs to be a, a pretty significant part of each one of those CRPs and, and cross-cutting programs. And so our, our um, new approach to, to uh, you know, the indicators and, and the sorts of results-based management approach that we're taking to assessing the successor or not so much success of, of these programs uh, needs to include a gender focus, and that's what this is trying to get at. Uh, but these are some of the quotes that came out of the interviews. I was living in harmony with my husband. He allowed me to go for trainings. He allowed me to handle income from sales. Without this, I would not have been able to adopt orange-fleshed sweet potato and benefit from it. And the other quotes are pretty, pretty much in the same way. And it may make us in this room somewhat uncomfortable because it's definitely placing the male, the husband, um, in the central role of being, you know, allowing certain things. But, but it, that's the truth of the matter is that gender norms do constrain um, opportunities, access to, to, um, to resources, um, and innovation as a result of that. So we need to understand them to be able to get any further. If the husband doesn't feel comfortable, the work won't go well. You know, this is something that these are from Uganda and from Vietnam. So it's not just one country that these are coming from. Uh, the other key message that, that they came up with is we must engage with men and masculinities. Um, and it goes beyond that, actually. My own, my own uh, you know, experience, and probably Julie and John have, have, have experienced this in South Asia, you not only need to engage with the men and the masculinities, you, engage, you need to engage with the mothers-in-law um, quite significantly because they hold a very tight grip on what the daughters-in-law can and cannot do. So this isn't something that came overtly out of this, but I, I suspect that that's very true and, and, and that's something we need to do. So what if a man allows his wife to sell vegetables at the market? That was sort of one of the questions that was thrown out. Um, a young men's group in Morocco, he will have a bad reputation, will have no authority over his wife. Villagers will tell of him he is not a man. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that if we're going to work and you know, empower women farmers um, and, 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 and do the, you know, have impact at scale, we need to address these sorts of things. And they, they, they tend not to be, they haven't, let, let me put it this way, it, it, historically they have not been paid attention to as much as probably they ought to have been. So hopefully these sorts of studies will, um, uh, will, will change that. And there's a quote from Bangladesh that's in a similar vein as well, with the husband being disgraced and shamed. Um, a lot of the, the, the gender um, impact, uh, the, the impact on women is felt, in, in, you know, is felt by them in their perception of whether, uh, and, and the men's perception of, of whether, how, to what extent are they able to move freely? I mean, in order to be an agent, a free agent, to, to be able to innovate, to be able to uh, affect your own life, you need to be able to move freely. Uh, and these are the perceptions from a focus group discussion of, of women's agency to be able to move freely in these countries. And you can see how it changes from um, one country to another. But what's interesting is it, of course, changes, as you might expect, it changes quite a bit from, from place to place. And of course, you know, as, as, as someone who grew up in India, I, I know this for a fact. I mean, I know that in states in North India, it's much more difficult. How women are viewed is quite different to how women might be viewed in my state, in Maharashtra, for instance. So, so there's definitely a regional component to this. Understanding these things, of course, is very critical to how you're operating in those localities. We, we're talking increasingly about location-specific options for farmers. Well, you know, you can go in and... and release a technology or, or expect it to just sort of be taken. But unless you understand these sorts of um, contexts, it's, it's very difficult to, to have that impact. So 
sort of wrapping up these next three slides, um, without that gender lens, we're assuming that farmers, the farmer, is, is the farmer. I mean, it's a homogenous group. Um, they have common interests. They have common problems. They act in the same way. And to varying degrees, we're guilty of this um, across regions, whether it's male farmers or female farmers or you know, looking at a gendered approach or a regional approach. There, there are nuances here that, that we need to pick up. I think we do a fairly decent job on, on other sorts of indicators. This one's a little harder to, to, to get. So um, employing a gender lens allows us to basically be more effective in, in, in um, the, the, the kinds of interventions that we're targeting towards the groups that we're targeting them for. So uh, understanding the, the social norms, understanding the, the power relationships, understanding um, the, the, the gender norms, of course, and, and what drives those, and who the sort of the, the dominoes are. Who are the, uh, not the dominoes, what's the word I'm looking for? The, you know, the key key person in that, in that network, in that particular, from the point of view of gender, I think it's very important to, to, um, to being effective in that region. And here's a, a case that I thought would be good to throw up. Um, a particular instance, pest and disease, disease management. Um, so the objective here was promoting uh, integrated pest management to farmers, right? Example one, teaching women how to deal with pests and diseases. <laughs> And they found that the women didn't apply what they learned. And that was because the husbands didn't approve. If the husbands don't approve, if you don't target the husbands and bring them along, they're not, you know, you're, you're, go you're not going to reach your target, essentially. Um, the other thing was teaching men not to use too much pesticide. And they didn't apply what they learned. The men didn't apply what they learned. Why was this? Because the women were saying, well, if a little bit is, is good, then a lot is excellent. So don't you know, ignore what you learned. Just, just go out there and, and spray or use whatever it is you're using. So, so understanding those differences and how men and women are thinking in a particular context is pretty critical. It's also very difficult, but it is pretty critical to, to making sure that, that we're um, having the impact that, that, that we need to have. And increasingly, for those of you who are students and thinking about a career at CGIR, um, I, th I think this is definitely seeping in to the bones of the, of the of the, of, the, of the framework, and so that, you know, increasingly there are more um, gender specialists being hired to work with these, within these programs. I think there used to be, if I'm not mistaken, there was a time when there used to be um, social anthropologists and, and folks like that who were doing similar kinds of work, but contributing very much to the understanding of the local circumstance. That's changed at CGIR, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we sort of started moving back into that, that domain. Um, I, I would hope we would. Good. So now I'm on sure ground because this is that stuff was <laughs> stuff that I was presenting um, that I know of, but it's being done by somebody else. Um, this this piece is the knowledge into impact or the knowledge into capability, which is the part that I'm very much involved in. Um, I I was leading at at the CGIR, what used to be the consortium office, and now it's called the system office uh, in Montpellier. Uh, I moved from CIMIT to CGIR, to the, to, the, to the CGIR consortium office, to lead the Gates-funded, $5 million Gates-funded uh, open access, open data initiative. Um, so, so, you know, that, that was sort of the start of some of the, the thinking behind this. And then that got, the sec phase two of that is now folded into the big data platform, and that's the part that I, I lead. Um, the background for this, where are the opportunities? Um, we already know that big data approaches um, and, and the whole idea of, of open data, particularly, has transformed the biomedical field. And this is something that I learned as, you know, working as a postdoc with Janice and get, getting into the uh, National Center for Biotechnology Information, you know, looking at all of that. Um, and the light bulb went off for me that, that this is, we need an NCBI for agriculture. We don't have that, and that's what we need. And so that's an idea that's sort of perpetuated through the years, and now I actually have a chance to, to realize that, which I'm delighted about. It's, it's really wonderful to have that opportunity. Um, so, and, and frankly, even, even, I shouldn't say even, but the ecologists are, are, are using, um, you know, are, are using big data. I mean, they've, they've got their act together better than, than us in agriculture. So um, uh, in terms of controlled vocabulary, in terms of actually applying the stuff, in terms of making the data available, um, they're further along in many ways than we are. So um, 
big data approaches are already transforming value chains so at the supermarket type level. Um, but, but it can have a big impact on how we do our business. I think increasingly going forward, we're going to be looking at uh, more and more mining of secondary data. I won't say less co collection of primary data, but I think there's going to be a shift in how we work. I mean, there's going to be much, it, as long as we can make that, our data sets and our publications um, available. So that's what the big data platform and big data approaches at CGI are, are trying to do. And then, of course, I've already sort of wrapped all of this up in what I said, but providing that access, um, open, open uh, access to our resources, publications and data in particular, um, is, is going to have a big difference in, in transforming agriculture, I think, in, in having the impact, um, addressing the kinds of problems, allowing us to address the kinds of problems um, that we address. So this is the sort of thing that, that we anticipate getting to in maybe 10 years, if we're lucky, um, answering this kind of question. And we have many of these technologies at hand. Hey, CG, when should I plant my maize? Um, and how should I manage it? So this is one of my farmers in Western Nepal picking up her, maybe even her flip phone, and, and, and asking the question in Nepali, and being, you know, that's the vision anyway, being able to get that answer. We're, I'm not claiming that we're close to it. But my mom always said that, that low aim um, and not, and not uh, you know, high aim is, is, is the failure. So, so, you know, you have to have the, the goal and the aspiration. So that's where we are. Um, natural language as an interface, using artificial intelligence, uh, training artificial intelligence, and this takes time, but, but it's, it's there already. Um, so we're liaising with, with uh, partners like IBM, for instance. IBM has Watson which is their computer that's been trained to look at oncological data, particularly with brain cancer related um, stuff. So how can we leverage these kinds of artificial intelligence capabilities in agriculture? Um, in order to be able to do that, in order to train any machine, you need the data. You need the data and the publications. So you need open, harmonized, um, interoperable uh, 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 data sets and, and publications from across the disciplines which are relevant. So that could be socioeconomics, could be remote sensing information, could be you know, agronomic trial data. So it's multidisciplinary. Um, and you need, of course, the key thing here is, is the weather data, which is one of the hardest things to get, and, and the reliable weather forecasts, which are very difficult to get as well at this point. Um, so weather and soil information is, is pretty critical to this as well. Um, many of these pieces are already there, so, but we're not doing a good job leveraging it. So this is where the big data platform comes in, uh, bringing big data to agriculture and agriculture to big, big data. That's, that's the name of the, the, the platform. It's just called the Big Data Platform for Agriculture. Um, again, the broad goal here is to, to make available, to, to, to have available open, harmonized, interoperable, um, integratable data sets. So to be able to, to look at uh, socioeconomic data and, and agronomic data and understand from the socioeconomic data perhaps what the drivers are for a particular technology being uh, taken up or not taken up in a particular region, for instance. Things like that, being able to integrate that to, to actually may, be able to make some decisions, to provide um, uh, some decision-making capability for us at, at, at CGIR, but also for our donors who want to answer this sorts of questions is, you know, well, I funded phase one and two. Should there be a phase three? And if, if there is a phase three, where should it be? Well, I need to, you know, be able to answer that question effectively. And that's not really possible right now where we are. But technologically, it is. So we have the capabilities, as, as I've already said. What we need to do is, is provide actionable information by integrating a variety of different kinds of data. So that includes weather data. It includes... Um, uh, management information, it includes input and output information, um, and increasingly, input, uh, you know, we're talking about drones, we're talking about uh, satellites, so we need to be able to bring together uh, not all of this da data all of the time, but, you know, be able to integrate the data where it makes sense, so contextually uh, making sense of all of that. So the big data platform uh, consists of essentially three big modules, or three pillars. Um, the, the sort of the heaviest of those is organize. That's the hardest work because it means organizing uh, um, research outputs across all of these 15 centers. And typically, the 15 centers have their own way of doing business. <laughs> they have, um, usually, each one has a, a, a data repository and a publications repository 
and the two are different platforms and they don't talk to each other, let alone talk to anything else. So, and it's very difficult to find them. So when you try to find uh, CGIR data, it's not easy to do that. Uh, you would have to know, if I'm looking for um, uh, drought tolerant maize, you would have to know that I have to go to Simit, and then I have to dig through Simit's website to find out you know, where that repository is, because doing a search on the website doesn't give you what you want. Um, and you don't necessarily know then that SIAT might be doing work on this, or IITA in Nigeria might be doing work on this. So it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, very, it's a very fractured kind of um, landscape. So what we're trying to do through the organized module that I lead is to support um, good data stewardship uh, all the way through the data life cycle and enable what's, what is increasingly being known as FAIR data. FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So we're going away from talking about open because open leaves too much open. <laughs> it's, 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 it leaves too much um, too, too open to interpretation, basically, uh, of what is open. We have PDF files of data, for instance, that people claim are open. So we're increasingly um, trying to move to, to certain standards there. Um, convening, recognizing that, that we at CGIR, we, we have the, the expertise or the, 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 the strength in, in the content piece. We're gathering the data. We have good data sets, and we have had for decades. Um, they're not open, but they're there, or they're not available, they're there. Um, but what we don't have is necessarily the IT expertise. We don't have the technical expertise. Um, we're not the ones who are going to be developing the apps that people can use to, to, to um, play with that, with that stuff, to play in that, in that sandbox. So this is where the convening part and bringing the strengths of our partners uh, to bear to what we're trying to do is, is, makes a big difference. Um, Inspire is, is sort of the blue sky thinking, trying to have a small pot of money to, um, to throw at interesting projects. So for, for we just, I just came out of the big data convention in Cali at SIAT in Colombia. And uh, we, we, you know, there's huge interest in, in all of this, really. There's a crying need, it seems like, because we anticipated uh, maybe we'll have 80 to 100 people. We had 300 people register. We weren't paying anybody's way. So we had 300 people register, and that sort of broke the sweat out on our collective brow. Uh, 200 people, 210 or so attended, of whom gladly, I mean, I'm really pleased to say that about half of those were not CGIR. So there's a, there's a you know, a, a strong desire to work with us and, and hopefully enable that convene. And then the Inspire, again, we, you know, we put out the call for certain Inspire types of projects. Um, and we got, I think, about 130 projects. We expected about 25, and we funded five. So we're trying, scrambling now, to find a larger pot of money for the next round, because they were really very good, many of them. So, so the question is, how can we you know, do a better job at this? But that's what the big data platform is about. So big data. How many of you know what big data is? OK. Well, typically, big data is, is qualified by the sort of the four or five Vs, or more Vs, perhaps. You know, I can never remember them all. But it's volume, velocity, veracity, you know, all of these things. In this domain, what we're talking about you know, we're talking about agronomic trials. We're talking primarily about agronomic and socioeconomic trials. We're not talking about you know, uh, very, very, um, we're not talking about um, genotyping. We're not talking about dig largely di digitally collected data, vast volumes of it. Uh, that's changing with high throughput pheno phenotyping approaches in the field. But still, we're talking about Mary, Bob, and Sherry's little data, my data, my, my data set, um, which then, if you move up the continuum, you're talking about maybe they share the data amongst themselves. It becomes shared data. Um, maybe they aggregate it. Um, and, and co-create, mush together those data sets and do something interesting with that. Um, so you're aggregating the data. But then when you actually aggregate that um, from, from a variety of different sources, um, <coughs> depersonalize it perhaps, and make it, set it free, make it available for other people to interact with, um, that's when you're sort of getting towards the big data. Um, and, and we're working across all of this. So the first thing we have to do, first thing I, I try to work on is getting that little data in the shape that it needs to be to do all of this other stuff. Um, and that's not easy. So what we're talking about primarily in the very entry level is enabling the discovery of CGIR data. And too often it looks like this. Um, everybody's walking off you know, with, their, with their laptops. It's all on everybody's you know, individual laptop. So as I mentioned, uh, we've 
through the years, through the last maybe five years, and primarily through the big data, the, the, the open access and open data work that Gates has funded, we've managed to get people to subscribe to the idea of repositories at least. Well, get, get your scientists to put the data and the publications in the repositories. Doesn't matter if it's two separate repositories. The problem is that they become silos as well and not very discoverable, as I said. So what we're working on now is to put that sort of lightweight infrastructure across these different silos so that you can have a sort of Google-like discovery mechanism for the data. And again, what we're trying to get towards is this findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. However, what you're looking at in trying to build this big data highway is rather daunting. Um, and one of the biggest issues we have is data quality. I mean, everyone's collecting data willy-nilly in different ways on pieces of paper in the field, translating them, you know, translating the data into Excel, um, trying to work through all of that, clean it, um, call it the same thing, annotate that data in a way that makes it possible to find it using the same keywords or same search terms, essentially, um, becomes a real big problem. So what are we working on there? I'm going to throw these up very quickly. Uh, we have something called the CG Core Metadata Schema that's being, been, been pushed out. It's taken a while to get centers to adopt it, but now every center has either adopted the CG Core Metadata Schema or is mapped to it. So what that means is that all of the resources in any of their repositories is described or is mapped to a common language, if you will, of, you know, I may call um, Julie, Julie, but if somebody else calls, calls her Mary, then I, I need to know that Mary and Julie are the same thing, essentially. So, so that kind of thing. That's a very bad example. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, so we're talking about a, a core metadata schema that allows this stuff to be found. We're also trying to address the issue of data collection, particularly for agronomic data, um, at, the, at, the, at the ground level rather than at the very end of the life cycle. You know, typically right now, Everything's done, and it's, then we're trying to get to it at the very end and sort of back engineer jerry-rig band-aids to try and make this stuff um, so, uh, described well. What we're trying to do here is to build uh, a fieldbook system, an agronomy fieldbook um, information management system, field information management system, essentially. Um, and we're working on this with actually one of my uh, prior colleagues at MAN, Brian Lowe, is... is involved in this because we're using some of the same technologies that we were using here at MEN. So it's, it's really cool stuff. Um, and what, what that'll do is allow people to collect di data digitally, but there's a tremendous pushback to collecting data digitally. So we're also enabling the downloading of a, of a field book as an Excel sheet. And then you upload the thing back. And if you have too many, if you have changes, then the thing will sort of give you a red light, hopefully, and say, no, you can't do this. You've got you've to harmonize with what we've called it. Um, and it's going to be a very simple, easy to use thing. It'll upload, it'll allow you to upload the completed field book. Um, and, the, and, and the data itself is going to be available as, um, well, linked open data. So don't worry about what that is. I have a slide to, sh to show you on what that is. But, but it's, it's a format, essentially, that, that allows you to play nice with any other data that's out there in the same format. So it's easy to integrate. It's, this is all thinking about how do we make the data integratable in the end. I want to integrate socioeconomic data with, with agronomic data, but let me at least try to integrate data collected in the CISA project in Nepal and in India. Not possible right now without spending a lot of time. If we can even get to that point, we're doing pretty good. So making uh, data fair, machines communicate and exchange data. That's what we are, we're all doing when we're interacting, you know, when we're going online, essentially. Um, that's syntactic interoperability. What we're talking about is going a step, sort of diving in a little bit more and talking about semantic interoperability, so ascribing meaning to things. So when I say, um, when I talk of a plant, do I mean an industrial plant or do I mean a, a green thing? So, so that sort of uh, semantic ascribing meaning is very important in being able, able to integrate data in ways that, that we, we want to do effectively. Um, and this is where ontologies uh, come into play. And, and all that an ontology is, is a system, a sort of a, a system of concepts, essentially, that are hierarchically linked um, in ways that make sense. So you're ascribing meaning right there by telling something that you belong to this concept that's linked to this concept that's linked to this concept. So it's a hierarchical structure, uh, knowledge structure, if you will. And we have ontologies that have been developed um, at CGIR with 
CGIR scientists, with breeders particularly. So this is a crop ontology, uh, which is led by Elizabeth Arnaud, who's, who works very closely with me, who's sitting at Biodiversity in Montpellier as well. Um, and so this is uh, several crops, our mandate, CG, all of the CGR mandate crops are there, all the way from um, rice, uh, wheat, maize, uh, potato, banana, you know, uh, roots, I mean, uh, 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 sweet potato, et cetera. Um, and this is what is, you know, this is just trying to show you, I don't know that you can read that in the back, but, but what, uh, uh, what, what terms in, in this ontology consist of is, um, you know, I have rice traits, I have certain traits. One of these is abiotic stress. Um, and within abiotic stress, I have different pieces, uh, alkali injury, cold tolerance, drought injury, drought, drought recovery. And each of these terms um, ha is, is related to an identifier that can be pulled in and used by other program, other machines, essentially, to call on this thing. Um, there's a method class. What, what kind of method is this, um, and, and how do you actually measure this thing? So, so roughly speaking, it's trying to impose a structure on how we're collecting data, which is exactly what we need to try and harmonize the different kinds of data. Um, why is this important? This is the linked open data cloud, which was essentially nothing 10 to 12 years ago. Um, this is the linked, uh, 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 the linked open data cloud from uh, this year, 2017. And what you see is a whole area of sort of magenta or pink, and that's the life sciences. It's mostly things like the protein database, nucleotides, you know, the genomic and, and genetic information uh, that the biomedical folks have been doing for a long time, and they're, they're up there in the linked open data cloud. And what that allows you to do is this format um, allows you to, to link with anything else that, that's, that makes sense um, in that cloud, essentially. And agriculture is pretty, pretty uh, non-existent there right now. Now, I'm not the kind of person who you know, gloms onto a technology just for the sake of it, but I truly believe that this is going to make a difference. In, I, I don't know any other, let's put it that way. I don't know if I, you know, that there is, this is, this is not easy to do. This is fairly heavy in, in terms of, you know, developing the ontology, maintaining it, you know, being able to leverage it, but I don't know of any other way of doing it, and I don't think, you know, the people, the technical people we speak with, um, are pretty much out to sea as well uh, to, to try, you know, this is a good approach given what we're trying to do, let's put it that way. So it has its downsides, but it definitely has its plus sides. So this is my last slide and then I, do I have some, some more time? Okay, okay. Um, so so I'll, I'll show you this. Don't worry if your eyes glaze over, but, <laughs> but I just wanted to throw this up because I'm gonna show you a demo that kind of pulls this in. Um, so we have a country, Tanzania, and we have a village called Long. That's part of that country of Tanzania. Now this little thing is a triplet. It's what's known as a triple. And it consists of, what I'm showing you is the resource description framework, or RDF, which underlies linked open data. This is what allows you to integrate things, uh, and you'll see why. But, but you have a village, it's, it's, there's a subject, an object, and a, a, a property or a predicate, which is, is part of. So it's like a sentence. You're developing these sentences. Um, the village of Long is part of the country of Tanzania. Well, there is a data set for carbon and nitrogen in the topsoil that's collected from the village of Long, which is part of the country of Tanzania. Um, this data set is collected by SIAD. So you, now you see these triples, kind of like puzzle pieces, being linked to each other in ways that make sense. I haven't broken this up as well as I could have because I got tired of making the little boxes. And the, <laughs> but you have uh, nitrogen content, which is part of that data set from plot one. You have nitrogen content from plot two. You have blah, 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 you know, on, onward. Now you have a second data set of maize yields from households, and that is collected by IFPRI. SIAT is, is our uh, International Center for Tropical Agriculture that's collecting this carbon and nitrogen data. And IFPRI, which is where I sit now, roughly speaking, is... is um, collecting um, maize yields from, as part of household surveys. So these are maize yields reported by households. I can see Julie kind of looking at me like, oh, well, since when has IFPRI started working in the field? Um, but um, to, to, you're seeing all of these different triples. You have maize uh, reported by household one kilograms per hectare, maize yield reported by household two, and on through the 700 plus data, set, uh, the data lines of this particular data set. Now you may have another data set somewhere sitting out there, weather data. Um, that's maybe collected by the Tanzanian 
Met service is very difficult to get, but it's there somewhere. Um, now, all of this is, you know, the, the kingpin, the linchpin linking that, of course, is the geography here. And typically it is for us, the geography, but, but there may be other ways of wanting to, to look at data, to integrate data sets. But you can see how these, all of these different pieces come together for that one particular location. I'm going to stop there with my presentation and move to the demo because you'll see what, what, I, what I mean. What we've built is something that I've normally called series. It's not series maze or series wheat or any of those models. The University of Florida folks sort of looked at me and said, series, but that's our name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is CGIR eResearch. And I'll say right off the start that we're calling it CGIR eResearch. It's intended initially to, you know, the, the, the thought that I have is, if anything works for CGIR, it will work pretty much anywhere else because it's such a complicated system. And you know, 15 centers, different focus areas, different geographies, different ways of doing things, um, different mind, mind, mind kind of approaches. So you know, if it works for CGIR, it should work for most other systems, hopefully. Um, by the end of the year or by early next year, we want to open it up so that there should be an upload data button to this. Right now what it is, is that infrastructure across those silos that I had a picture of. So what it's doing is giving you a box and you can do a search. So I'll do a search for um, Maze Tanzania. Did I type a T? Yeah. Like that. And I find, um, was this already the way it was? Okay, so it got stuck. So, it's, so I'm finding publications and data from across CGIR here. So if you look at the, uh, ooh, how do I navigate if I don't see it here? I guess I have to navigate from here. Right. Um, what you're seeing is, if you look at, look at these labels here, they're coming from uh, a variety of different places, and I need to do this. Um, so these are data sets of publications that are coming from a variety of different centers. And here you actually see the data that's from IITA and ILRI, uh, which is a livestock institute, um, and so on. There are many pages here. You can scroll through and look at it. If you go to the bottom of this thing, you, you can see that data is being pulled in right now from the gene banks. So it's, right now it's just maize. But if I typed in something like maize drought, uh, Tanzania, and if those terms were in the gene, uh, the gen bank, in the, um, not gen bank, what's it called? The Genesis, which is the database of, of the gene bank's platform, then you would see uh, that the, you know, those, those particular points being shown on the, uh, you know, by geography here. So, you know, we're, this is very, very early. It's a very early prototype. Um, but we're working through the glitches right now, and we're working to expand what this does um, and, and work out some of the bugs. Now, if you can go here, uh, let me see if I can find an older data set that I can actually click on. Here, here's an ILRI one uh, from 2014. The reason I'm clicking on the older one is because the newer ones aren't yet, you know, they're being pulled in because the metadata is there, but the data sets themselves won't be available. But at least you're able to find them. You can request them by going to the, uh, to the person who's collected that data. Now, if I wanted to find out what this is, I can go to ILRI, and it should show me, here's the data itself. It gives you a little bit of what this is. It gives you a little bit of the, um, the information about the data. It's a joint, uh, uh, a joint exercise between IFPRI and ILRI, it looks like, and I should be able to download the data from the earlier page. Where is it? Uh, typically, it tends to be an Excel spreadsheet, yeah. yeah. So um, I, can, you know, I can go back and find the data that I want, and I can download it, I can, you know, which is a huge improvement over what it was before, because you couldn't find any of this stuff. Um, and when I go to any of these data sets, I should be seeing at the bottom of this what the related publications are. So I said something about building the NCBI for agriculture. This is a step in the right direction because what NCBI allows you to do for genomics, particularly genomics and genetics um, uh, resources, is find related information that's contextually linked. So we're, we're, we're and this, this isn't always, um, you know, 100% there yet, uh, but, but it, it's getting there. We have a lot of work to do still. There's a map view that we want to leverage further. So uh, right now it has, you know, you can look at all of this. There's all kinds of crops here that you can look at, you know, banana, total harvested area globally, um, and it should map it. 
But what we want to do is use these kinds of uh, functionalities to do uh, dynamic sort of go to the map, choose a polygon, you know, an area on the map, and then get to the data sets there, you know, be able to kludge things together. So there's lots of interesting stuff we can do. The technology is there. We're getting started right now. This is very, very new. Um, all right, so then what if I wanted to, uh, what I want to do, this is the what if scenario. Um, I talked about RDF and the, and, and the semantic web and linked open data. Well, this is telling you a little bit about, you know, okay, you can, you can, it's great to achieve fairness at the metadata level, which is where we are right now, pretty, pretty much. But if you were able to express resources as linked open data, um, you could link them, as I said, you could play with this, with all the data sets in here as, as appropriate. So here's sort of a demo within the demo, which I've already done for you. I want to know about maize uh, cultivation in Tanzania. So if I type that into my search box, um, I get, uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it for you to save time, but I can, I get, well, here, I'll just do it. <laughs> right. So I want, am I typing that right? Yep. To know. Good. Oh, yes. Where's my thing, Bob? Right. So I can do that kind of search here, and what it's doing, this is just showing you, um, you know, it's a demo within the demo, like I said, so it's, you know, pre canned. Um, we've, we've taken those two data sets that I talked about, you know, the, the thing that I showed you, the, the carbon and nitrogen in the topsoil data set from SEAT, and the IFPRI maize household, you know, maize yields reported by households from IFPRI, and just worked with those two data sets to get them into the form that we can do neat stuff with. And now I can see here, this is the first one is, give me all, all maize yields for Tanzania under no fertilizer and complete fertilizer conditions. Um, now imagine doing, querying this against all of the data that's sitting in here. If all of this was available, I could say, give me maize yields, give me the, you know, let me see what the maize yields for Africa are. What do they look like? I should be able to do that in two years, maybe less, <laughs> depending on how many data surfs we can gather to, to clean up the data. Um, but, uh, so let's look at this one. Don't worry about the sparkle query business. Um, but I execute that, and what I get is a visual that allows me to very quickly get some idea of what are, what are we talking about here for the data. So now this is going into the data set, picking out the data, and, and giving, even visualizing it for you. How long would you have to take to do this, to clean up that data, to understand what it is? I did that for you. Thank you, Meta. <laughs> Well, um, it took me a while to get the data set into that shape, but if we went about this the right way from the beginning and collected the data correctly and had it in the right format, we could do this very easily. So, you know, it's, it's really um, both exciting and frustrating. Um, this one, yeah, okay, last one. Give me the yields of improved and not improved maize reported by households along with the CNN. So here's where I'm actually integrating the data. And when I execute that Sparkle query, this is what I get. I mean, this isn't necessarily that meaningful because the, 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 the data, this, you know, in one case the data is reported by households, in the other it's, it's carbon and nitrogen contents for particular parts of that uh, geography, but the geography is the same. So what I'm trying to show you here is the fact that we can integrate data in, in ways that could be very powerful, and it's a click of a couple of buttons. But we need the data in that format. So this is where we are with the work that we're doing. Um, we're going to go very, very far forward, I hope, in the next year with Ceres um, and, and with the help of our data surfs, of whom, you know, I'm looking for a model right now for data quality um, and cleaning. And, and so, you know, we'll work with partners probably to do that. We should be able to get quite far along here. So that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you. Thank you.